Hello students, welcome back to another lecture video for ComSci 125 operating systems. In this chapter, we're going to talk about the process API. So we discussed in the previous videos the purpose of the API. The API is to provide or to allow the user, the users uh, application developers, system programmers to use the services provided by the operating system. And what we're going to discuss in this video is the API provided by Unix systems and Unix-like systems like Linux. So, in this chapter, we're going to talk about three main system calls that are related to processes. Recall that in the previous videos, we were talking about processes as an abstraction and basically it's a mechanism to allow users to run programs and virtualize the CPU. So in this uh, chapter, we're going to look at the fork system call, the exec system call, and the wait system call, and other related or process related system calls. So let's start with the fork system call. Now this system call is mainly used to uh, create a new process. So remember that the differentiation between a process and the program and the process is running, it's a running program okay? and the fork system call actually creates a new process from a running process. You can think of this as you can only create a process from a running process. So what do we mean by that? Okay, um, so this means that when a process is created, recall that a process will have uh, several things like the code, the data, the stack, the heap. So basically the machine state. And the newly created process will have its own address space, its own set of registers, and a program counter. So these are the main information that will be unique to a newly created process. Now, uh, this example code here, p1.c, illustrates the use or illustrates how to use the fork system call. And um, I think it would be better if we're going to look at it in the actual source code. But let's take a quick look at the output here. So this is the actual execution and you see some process information here. So we have a process ID. So each process has a process ID and that is used to reference that particular process. So let's take a look at the code. So again, this code is available online from the OSTEP GitHub repository. So our main folder for this video will be the CPU API. And we have the files here. Now I made some modifications in the make file. 
which is different from the original. I added the dot elf extension to at least to signify that the executables are elf files. And I also added a flags here, minus G, which generates debug information from uh, for the executable so that we can debug these executables in GDB as uh, I will show later. So of interest to us in this part of the lecture will be P1.C. So let's take a look at the code. Okay. So it has the typical uh, include directives for the STDIO and STD Live. And for the use of the system calls, we need to include the uh, unistd.h, which is the header file that contains the function prototypes for Unix uh, standard or typical API provided by Unix operating systems like for x and wait. So what this code does is to first, you see here the get PID. So let's put this code this terminal. So we see here that we have the um, get PID. So what is this get PID? So remember that in Linux systems, we have a process identifier that identifies each process. So if we look at the man page for this system call, so it says here that uh, the summary is to get the process identification and it returns a PID underscore P. So the description states that the get PID returns the process ID of the calling process. And this is often used by routines that generate a new template. But in the case of our example here, what we're doing here is from within the program, we are retrieving the process ID that is associated when this program is run. Then we have, after this slide, we have the fork system call. And then the fork system call okay, is the one that will create the process and it return if the return value is less than zero, that means that the fork failed. Okay. What we mean by the, what we, what do we mean by the fork failed? Meaning the there was no process created. What are the reasons that a process will not be created? One is the lack of resources. Let's say you run out of memory or some other errors that will cause the failure of the creation of a process. For example, some system limits are imposed, so you can only, you are only, a certain user is only given or allowed to create a limited number of processes. So the first uh, condition here, so this is the first check, if the return value is less than zero, then for fail. If the return value is zero, this is the child process. And what it does is to output, hello, I am the child, and it also gets the PID. So this int here typecasts the return value of get PID. Remember that as shown in the man page, get PID returns PID underscore P. So we typecast it to in so that we can output it output the PID as an integer. Now if the so 
An important thing to remember with the uh, with the frog system code is that if the return code is zero, that means you are executing in the child process. Otherwise, if the return code or the return value of fork is not zero, that means you are running in the parent process or the original process. So hello, I am parent of this particular PID of the child process. Okay. And that's the simple code. So let's build this. So it's been done already. If you want to rebuild this, so let me run the code. I think I invoked the wrong, the wrong So here is the output of the execution. So we have the hello world, this is the line earlier. And then this is the process ID of the process 4110, which is the parent process. And then we have the this one here. Uh, this is also running on the parent process but after the fork was called and this line here is the child process running which is with the process id of 41111 so if we execute this multiple times so you will observe the different values for the process id so it's important to remember that the process ID will be different after uh, for each execution. Okay. Okay, so let me look for a way to. What I'm trying to achieve is for the child process to run first to display this first up, uh, up before this. Okay, so that there will be an exchange but you can run this multiple times depending on the state of the system the order of the execution of the parent and the child may uh, differ but the first part here will always be the parent process because this line here is uh, comes before the fork system part get the idea for the particular execution so while observing the execution of this piece of code okay, what are the things that we can take note of the first one is that the original p1 process prints its PID uh, in this example this 29146 so this is the first part and then a call to fork is made which creates a new process with PID 29417 and it's almost similar to the parent process it's called the child process notice that the child process uh, began execution after the call to fork instead of the start of main Okay, so this is evident in the code okay. so this always comes first but the execution of this one is uh, happens uh, does not start with the execution of this code here because this part of the code is part of the parent process so it is only after the for code that Come, uh, that comes after fork 
depending on the condition will be executed and then the child process has its own uh, private private address space uh, registers and the program counter which is different from the parent process so for return zero to the child process and the child PID to the parent process as shown in this part here so else if the return code is not zero then you are running in the parent process now the order of execution of the parent and the child processes is uh, non-deterministic and dependent on the scheduler okay so that's the fork system from the illustration maybe I can give you a, an example of this by looking at by debugging this code So this code was compiled with debug, debug information. So you can we uh, can debug this. So I think it would be better if we use a user interface. So let's start. So in the upper part, you see the source code here. Is what we're going to debug. So let's set a breakpoint the main program. And it's the breakpoint, and then let's run it. Okay, so the execution so this is now the the program counter uh, will now uh, run here. Okay. Um, so let's take a look at the processes. So this is the process ID of this code that you are debugging. If we look at the status of this code, so we see that this is p1.f and this is uh, tracing meaning it's running in the debugger as i discussed in the previous video so we can also look at the memory so this is the address space of the process this particular process so we have the different regions of memory we have shared memory uh, as you can see here we have the stack so this is the address space and you can also look at the state of execution of this process and look at the values of the registers here so this is the, these are the values of the registers for this particular process now let's continue tracing the code because we are interested in the fork system call so click uh, type n so it will proceed to the next instruction next line of c code then click n again so this is the output he lowered pid so we're done executing this line uh, the next uh, line that you are going to see is the fork call so let's try this and you will see that the there's a message that says detaching after fork from child process 5580 so going back to the terminal below so uh, 
I lost the value. Okay, there, let's uh, repeat the process again. And then quant. So let's go to so this is the output of this one here. So let's try to call for. So we have. Uh, so this is the parent process, and this is the process ID. So if we look, if we grab for this health processes, we're going to have two uh, processes with p one dot health. So this is what we mean by uh, the process forking another process so the images of this process are the same so this is the parent process 5581 and this is the child process 5582 so it says here it's defined what do we mean by that so let's take a look at the process number 5582 and so it's called a zombie process. The state of this process is a zombie, meaning it has finished, but uh, its entry in the process table has not been cleaned up yet. But going back to this code, uh, we click type, type N, so it went to this condition. This means that uh, we are in the child process so if type n oh no, it will check first if we are in the child process so what does it tell us it, tell, uh, it tells us that we are in the parent process so it skip the child process we are not in that process right so we are in the parent process and we enter this block of code which will display that hello i am the parent so after the this code is executing this line the parent process will die but uh, again, this process is still running the, zomb the zombie process. Okay. Then, if I press N, then eventually this will end the execution of the process, and there will be no more P1 processes running because the entire sequence has uh, completed already. So that's what how the system call for creates processes. So we, we only have initially we only have one p one dot elf. Then after the fork, we now have two p one dot elf. The first one is the parent process. The second one is the child process. And after the parent ends, the child will also. And so you see uh, a while ago that the child process beca became a zombie process so it is not it's, it's some kind of a lost process okay uh, the next uh, section of the lecture will be about the weight system call so in the example uh, earlier the parent is possible to finish without waiting for the child to finish so here uh, we have the wait system call which allows the parent process to wait for the child process to finish before uh, the parent continues its execution okay so uh, let's take a look at the code here so again, the almost the same code, but the main difference is the 
presence of this line here. So we have a call for weight. Well, let's take a look at the description of this uh, code, this function. So this uh, system call will wait for a process to change its state. Okay. So this is actually the call that were that was uh, used the version of your wait call. So the status is set to none, and then it returns the process ID. So what does uh, what does this do? Okay. Uh, all of the system calls are used to wait for state change in the tab of the calling process. So it returns what? So the wait system call suspends the execution of the calling thread until one of its children terminates. The call wait status is equivalent to wait PID. Okay, so it's short wrapper. Uh, the value of PID can be less than negative one. Okay, uh, meaning wait for any child process with process group ID. We have process groups later. We'll discuss that. And uh, uh, zero. So there are other, these are other uh, important uh, values okay, for this particular system call. So going back to the slides this is how it's done so what will happen here in the execution is that adding the call to wait on the code block uh, for the parent process guarantees that the child process will finish first before the parent process so the order of execution is deterministic here so the child process will always finish first before the parent process even if even if right after the call to fork the parent process is selected by the scheduler so it's actually the scheduler that selects the order or which process to run uh, even if the scheduler selects the parent process uh, but since the the first line of the block for the parent process is wait it will the parent process will wait will block until the child process returns or finishes all okay, right so maybe let's take a look at the actual code so we are interested in p2.c so this is very similar to the code, but with the addition of this um, wait call. So if we run this, so you notice that the child finishes first before the parent uh, finishes. In the previous code, it is the parent that finishes first that's why the child process beca becomes a zombie process the parent died or the parent process completed but the child process is still alive therefore it's called a zombie process but if we have the wait uh, if we use the wait system call we can uh, let the child process finish first before the uh, parent continues its execution thus the child process terminates normally it's not its state does not become uh, zombie okay so that's the idea for the weight system point The next uh, function or system call is the exec system call. 
So this way you run a program that is different from the calling program. In the fourth example we said earlier, we have p1.l and then as the parent process and then another p1.l as the child process. So they are uh, of the same program image. Now the exec system call allows the execution of a different program for the newly created process. So it runs a program that is different from the calling program. So instead of p1.l, we're going to have a different or a different executable being executed. So here the job process will have different code static data, other space registers, and program counter. So it's totally new. In the previous examples, the code and static data of the child process are the same as the parent process, right? After the code to fall. So in this example, we're going to run a different program after a process has been created. So I guess it's better if we look first, first let's look at a sample run here, but this is the idea here. So we have uh, the program is P3, so this is the parent process. This is the child process, but it executes a different program, which is actually word count, and then we have the parent process executing back again. So I, I think it's better if we look at the actual source code. So almost the same code and then we have the uh, child uh, this is the child process, the part of the, oh no, this is the failure, right? This is the failure of, in case the, uh, no process was created. This block here represents the child process executing. Now, these lines here, okay, starting here, uh, is the new program or the call to exec, the exec that allows the loading of a different program okay. so it says that this shouldn't print out okay. and then of course the parent process will have to wait for the uh, child process to finish before executing back again so let's try this code so here's what happens okay. so we have again we have the output of the parent process is that First, I did the parent process, then a child process is created, but it also executes a different program here. And then, after the completion of this code, the parent process resumes its execution. So, let's take a look. Uh, let's take a look at exec system call. So we have here, so the exec system call actually has different versions. What was used in the sample code P3 is this one, exec VP. Okay. So what does this uh, function, system call do? This exec family of functions replaces the current process image with a new process image. So the functions described in this model page are front ends for exec VE. And let's take a look at its exec VP. So this is exec VP. So we have a character, uh, it's actually an array of string argument, right? That contains to the parameter of the program. So let's take a look at the code again.
So this is the actual call, but before the actual call, we have to uh, set up the second argument, which is my args. So it's basically an array of strings. So the first one will be the name of the executable, which is actually word count, and then the parameter, and then the last, the null. Uh, you set the last argument to null. So without using this code, let's try to uh, use the word first. Let's look for the word count. So word count is a file located in this directory or this folder. If we look at word count, it says it uh, prints new line word and byte counts for a file. So this is a pretty slick command. And uh, we can check whether this uh, what type of file this wc is so it is an elf executable that means we can run it then if we so the code here accepts uh, the word count command accepts a, an argument which is the file okay, so we can actually try this uh, wc p3.c and this is the output of the code okay now if we run uh, p3.l so we'll notice that this exact output is the same as this output if as if if we invoke the word count command from the shell but here we actually invoke the word count command from the process that was created in pt let's see so i guess it's better if we're going to look at this in gdb code here okay so let's uh, set a breakpoint here in I'm just guessing here, 16. No, it's the 9. So, anyway, so let's run that from that point. And then we see the end. Okay. So let's look at the fork system call. So at this point, at this point here, we are now in the parent process and let's take a look at the processes running. So we are debugging pt.l. So we are sure that we have p3.elf here. Now, do we have wc running? Yes, we have wc running. Right. So 
is actually defunct. So let's take a look at that part. 7816 So it's also a zombie process because we are running it inside GDB okay. So let's go back to GDB continue and we are now back to the uh, parent process Again, okay. then run it again. So here you have the actual completion of the process. Now, what was shown earlier, the WC process was defunct because uh, GDB was not in control of the execution of that process but this time here we see that we have this particular uh, process actually completed okay so that's the demonstration so in this code uh, this means that the exec uh, loads the code and static data in the case of example we're actually loading word count okay, so given the name of the executable into the child process other space which originally contains the code and static data of the parent process right after the call to form okay. and the successful call to exec never returns as shown in the example code here or this one this part here this should uh, shouldn't print out why because this exec VE we actually have a new program image which is separate from this original p3 dot L so that's the story of the exec system code now the next discussion that will be interesting is why do we need to separate fork and exec? Okay. Now the main advantage of this operation is that this is essential for building a shell. A shell is an interface program that accepts commands from users to access the services of the OS. So you know already the shell, what the shell is. Okay, so what we're using here is the shell. So that means that I am using the bash shell. So if you look at this, uh, and then if we look at this executable, So we say that this is an uh, executable. So this is actually a program also that allows the execute that allows us to run commands. So this is the prompt we have here. Okay. So going back. Okay. So examples are for Linux we have the bash for and then we have the Z shell if you're using Arc Linux. Uh, for Windows, we have the command prompt and PowerShell as uh, examples of shell. So with separation, the shell can run uh, some code after the call to fork but before the call to exec. So this uh, space between uh, after calling fork and before calling exec the parent process or if you're writing a shell okay uh, can do some 
magic that will allow it to change the environment of the what uh, uh, what to execute about what to execute process examples of these features will include uh, pipes and uh, input output redirection so that's why we have a separate fork and exec system calls in some operating systems uh, they simplify this with the spawn system call in DOS for example uh, if you want to run a program you call this a spawn function but in Linux, Unix, Linux type or Unix type systems we have the four X combination so it's a continuation example of input output in direction so we have the output of word count instead of being shown to the screen in the screen is saved or redirected to a text file so this example code here so let's demonstrate that so if you have the code or if you have the command uh, wt minus p3.c this will be out the output so it will be printed to the screen but if we use uh, redirection there will be no output on the screen but there will be a new file here and then when we got that so this output instead of, be, of being displayed to the screen was actually saved to a file uh, shown here new file txt so how did that happen okay now for a shell to implement this what it does is to close the standard output recall our discussion last time uh, when a new process is created usually there are there are three file descriptors created standard input standard output and standard error so to, to be able to do the uh, redirection as shown as demonstrated uh, the shell will have to close the std out file descriptor of uh, the process the parent process after the fork and then open so we use the open system call to create a new file before actually calling exec okay so why does this work this works because the open system call starts from zero when lo looking for available file descriptors to use since std out if the file descriptor one so that's the number file descriptor for std out was closed the call to open will assign fd1 to new file the txt and the will be treated as the std out after the call to exec so that's how it works so we have a sample here so, so we have an example code here p4.c but let's take a look at the actual uh, source code So here is the code. So it, uh, the, the the technique is first to close the std out file number for this particular process, and then open this file. So remember this syntax which we demonstrated in uh, the previous chapter. So this will create a file and then perform the exec here. Okay. So first, uh, let's comment out this code, these lines of code, because these these two lines are uh, the essential lines to demonstrate 
I or indirection. But let's try this first without with first commenting those two lines. So, so we have the P four the L. So it's just uh, nothing. Okay, it's just the typical uh, P three, very similar to P three, and. Uh, we don't notice any new file. Uh, let's remove this p4.output. Okay. Okay. So we don't have p4.output, but if we okay. If we do this, okay, so what will happen is we close the std out of uh, the child process and we close the std child process and then we create a file here p4.output and then we call exit v so if we run this code again so there will be no output to the screen but we will see uh, p4.output here and then if we cut that then we're going to have this output so by just uh, adding these two lines given that we have a separate fork and exec system calls we were able to redirect the output of word count to a file by closing the std out of that to the child process and then assigning it to the to a file so anything that is written uh, to the screen by the new uh, process new image new program image loaded by exec will go to the file so that's the magic of that uh, redirection okay and in addition to input output redirection we also have pipes but we're not going to show the actual uh, implementation so but pipes works in a similar or pipes work in a similar manner but uses in kernel data structures for inter-process communication accessible using the pipe system call so the implementation of this will be via the pipe system call let's take a look at the man page of that system call so this one creates a pipe okay so you need uh, some uh, additional structures here so this is the sample call so you need to have uh, file descriptors for the uh, pipes associate uh, file descriptor for the pipes okay so pipes create a pipe uh, a unidirectional data channel that can be used for inter-process communication okay so there so this is uh what happens here uh example uh, the std out of ps is connected to the stdn of grep through a pipe so this is a, an example which uh, i showed you earlier when we were trying to look for the process id of running processes so 
this one will have std out by connecting that to the std in of uh, grep then we have two processes ps and grep communicating via a pipe so that's uh, another uh, interesting uh, mechanism in unix operating systems although in windows we also have pipes similar mechanisms also so it's a data channel unidirectional data channel between two processes okay and uh, next is process control and users so there are other process related system calls for example we have the kill system call which is used to send signals to a process so uh, personally i use this to kill processes when uh, i no longer need them or some let's say some program or some process hangs some window hangs so i can use kill uh, uh, com uh, kill command which implements the kill uh, system call so there's a mechanism called signals for example uh, by pressing ctrl c the if you, are, if you are running a program and then you press ctrl c that will send uh, a terminate uh, or an interrupt to the running process that will receive it so i demonstrated sig stop and uh, sig con in pre in the previous videos Okay. So signals the signal sub system enable the delivery of events to processes and processes and process groups. So remember, uh, although we discussed that processes usually are isolated uh, as a single entity for execution obstruction, it's also possible for several processes to be grouped into a process group for example in case they perform similar functions so we can associate a, a process can be can belong to a process group and whenever a signal is sent to the process group every process that belongs to that process group will receive that particular signal so we actually have the signal system call Let's take a look at the man page of that. So here you have uh, the signal, then you have to specify the signal number to capture and then the handler. What, what function will execute when that particular signal specified here where the signal number is received by this by the calling process which in the calling process the process that is calling the signal uh, system call so that's uh, all about signals and uh, processes also are associated with users so remember that whenever i went up uh, on a linux system i log into the linux system uh, i am given a shell and from that shell i can run programs and the programs that are running will have uh, owners and uh, the owners are specified by the user id so let's say So, as you can see here, we have uh, processes okay, that are owned or run are running okay, uh, owned by the user from say 125, which is actually the current user that is logged in here in this uh, particular system in my machine here 
So processes are associated to users in order to provide some ownership and control as well as limited security and protection. So you cannot kill uh, a process that you do not own. Okay. Example of a function for uh, that are related to users it will be the get UID, which is system call uh, to return the user ID of the user of the user uh, of the process that is calling this get uh, UID. For some useful commands uh, for process related uh, work, so we have demand page as I demonstrated. During the early days, we don't have Google, so we have demand page to learn about the commands. Uh, top and H top. Okay, I demonstrated it. PS and PS3. So PS3 is uh, useful for uh, looking at the hierarchical structure of process relationships. So you see here that in modern Linux systems, we have system B as the main, very first process. And then from that, other processes will uh, spawn. So for example, so if I run bash, okay. and then, uh, the PS, so we have a lot of uh, shells here. Uh, let's look for uh, PID. Okay, so we have PID. PS3 2240. So you will notice that we have bash, 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 and then PS3. Do we have a CSH here? So we have another TCSH here. We have a C shell here. Oh, we, have, we have no other shells here, so but this will show us that we have several layers of bash. Then if we So that's the idea of PS3. Then we have kill and kill all, and FG and jobs, and of course this uh, prop file system. Okay, so that ends this uh, chapter.